Hey everyone, welcome back to my Let's Play of Z39 Steps. We are going to start in our next chapter, which is dubbed An Unlikely Visit. Resolved to leave England for the Cape, Hanae's outlook changes as a mysterious visitor drops by. Ooh. Let's play. An Unlikely Visit. I'm excited. Wimpole Street, London. door. Hey, can I speak to you? Mm. May I come in for a minute? I recognized him as the occupant of a flat on the top floor, with whom I had passed the time of day on the stairs. He was slim, with a short brown beard and small, gimlety blue eyes. His hand was pawing at my arm. I motioned him in. Ooh, time to do our thing again. Uh oh. Meh. 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 Okay, cool. No sooner was he over the threshold than he made a dash for my back room where I used to smoke and write my letters. Then he bolted back. Is the door locked? Calm down. He filled himself a stiff whiskey and soda and drank it off in three gulps. I sat down in an armchair and lit my pipe. I was pretty certain that I had to deal with a madman. I'm very sorry. It's a mighty liberty, but you look like the kind of man who would understand. I've had you in my mind all this week when Ooh. things got troublesome. Say... Will you do me a good turn? I'll listen to you. That's all I'll promise. Pardon. I'm a bit rattled tonight. You see, I happen at this moment to be dead. What does it feel like? A smile flickered over his drawn face. I'm not mad. Yet. Say, sir, I've been watching you, and I reckon you're a cool customer. I reckon, too, you're an honest man and not afraid of playing a bold hand. I'm going to confide in you. I need help worse than any man ever needed it. I want to know if I can count you in. Doesn't even know his name. Get on with your yarn and I'll tell you. Your yarn? The queerest rigmarole. <laughs> Franklin P. Scudder was an American from Kentucky. After college, being pretty well off, he started out to see the world. There's a little boat scuttling over to Spain. Big little train through France and Germany. Durpin. He wrote a bit and acted as a war correspondent for a Chicago paper. Tensions in the Near East. Balkan affairs test Europe. Blah, blah. He had played about with politics, first for interest, but then because he couldn't help himself. Then he made his discovery. Very skinny. <laughs> Way behind all the governments and the armies, there was a big subterranean movement going on, engineered by some very dangerous people.
the sort of educated anarchists that make revolutions. Because the deer's watching him. And behind them were financers who were playing for money. That must be the big bank. They wanted Russia and Germany at loggerheads. Loggerheads? Explosion. Everything would be in the melting pot. The anarchists looked to see a new world emerge, while the capitalists would make fortune by buying up wreckage. And Scudder had himself convinced that Jewish men were behind it all. On the 15th day of June, Constantine Karolides is coming to this Karolides, I remember that. The British Foreign Office has taken to having international tea parties, and the biggest of them is due on that date. Now, Karolides has reckoned the principal guest, and if my friends have their way, he will never return to his admiring countrymen. I set up for that, for I had been reading about Karolides that very afternoon. Yes, we did. Well, that's simple enough, anyhow. You can warn him and keep him at home. <laughs> and play their game. If he does not come, they win, for he's the only man that can straighten out the tangle. And if his government are warned, he won't come, for he does not know how big the stakes will be on June the 15th. I was beginning to get interested in the beggar. Well, what about the British government? They're not going to let their guests be murdered. Tip them the wink, and they'll take extra precautions. No good. They might stuff your city with plainclothes detectives and double the police, and Constantine would still be a doomed man. He'll be murdered by an Austrian, and there'll be plenty of evidence to show the connivance of the big folk in Vienna and Berlin. It will all be an infernal lie, of course, but the case will look black enough to the world. But it's not going to come off if there's a certain man alive right here in London on the 15th day of June. And that man is going to be your servant, Franklin P. Scudder. Collected Scudder. Yay. I was getting to like the little chap. His jaw had shut like a rat trap, and there was a fire of battle in his gimlety eyes. Gimlety. Where did you find out this story? I completed my evidence ten days ago in Paris. I can't tell you the details now, for it's something of a history. But when I was quite sure in my own mind, I judged it my business to disappear. And I reached this city by a mighty queer circuit. Till yesterday, I thought I had muddied my trail some, and was feeling pretty happy. Then... The recollection seemed to upset him, and he gulped down some more whiskey. Then I saw a man standing in the street outside this block. I used to stay close in my room all day, and only slip out after dark for an hour or two. I watched him for a bit from my window, and I thought I recognized him. He came in and spoke to the porter. When I came back from my walk last night, I found a card in my letterbox. It bore the name of the man I want least to meet on God's earth. I think that the look in my companion's eyes, the sheer naked scare on his face, completed my conviction of his honesty. And what did you do next? I realized I was bottled as sure as a pickled herring, <laughs> and that there was only one way out. I had to die. If my pursuers knew I was dead, they would go to sleep again. How did you manage it? How Scudder died. Step one. I told the man who valets me that I was feeling pretty bad and got myself up to look like death. That wasn't difficult, for I'm no slouch at dis dis disguises. I've run out of clay. <laughs> Then I got a corpse. You can always get a body in London if you know where to go for it. I fetched it back in a trunk on the top of a four-wheeler, and I had to be assisted upstairs to my room. <laughs> like, where do I find a corpse graveyard? Transport stairs. So helpful. I had to pile up evidence for the inquest, so I went to bed and got my man mm, to mix me a sleeping draught, and then I told him to clear out. 
He wanted to fetch me a doctor, but I swore some and said I couldn't abide leeches. When I was left alone, I started to fake up that corpse. He was my size, and I judged that he had perished from too much alcohol, so I put some spirits around the place. The jaw was the weak point of the likeness, so I blew it away with a revolver. Well, fantastic. I dare say there will be somebody to swear having heard a shot, but there are no neighbors on my floor, and I guess I could risk it. I left the body in bed dressed up in my pajamas with a revolver lying on the bed clothes and a considerable mess around. Then I got into a suit of clothes I had kept waiting for emergencies. I didn't dare shave for fear of leaving tracks, and besides, it wasn't any kind of abuse my trying to get into the streets. Have we read them all? Yes. I had had you in my mind all day, and there seemed nothing to do but to make an appeal to you. I watched from my window till I saw you come home, and then slipped down the stair to meet you. He sat blinking like an owl, fluttering with nerves, and desperately determined. There, sir. I guess you know about as much as me of this business. Oh, <laughs> we're opening the drinky. I was now pretty well convinced that he was going straight with me. It was the wildest sort of narrative but I had heard in my time many steep tales which had turned out to be true. And if he had wanted to get a location in my flat and then cut my throat, he would have pitched a milder yarn. Hand me your key, and I'll take a look at the corpse. Excuse my caution, but I'm bound to verify a bit if I can. I reckon you'd ask for that. But I haven't got it. It's on my chain on the dressing table. I had to leave it behind, for I couldn't leave any clues to breed suspicions. The gentry who are after me are pretty bright-eyed citizens. You'll have to take me on trust for the night, and tomorrow you'll get the proof of the corpse business right enough. Hmm. I thought for an instant or two. Right. I'll trust you for the night. I'll lock you into this room and keep the key. Just one word, Mr. Scudder. I believe you're straight, but if so be you are not, I should warn you that I'm a handy man with a gun. I haven't the privilege of your name, sir, but let me tell you that you're a true gentleman. Now, I'll thank you to lend me a razor. I took him into my bedroom and turned him loose. Ooh. In half an hour's time, a figure came out that I scarcely recognized. My hat, Mr. Scudder. A new man, similarities. Only his gimlety, hungry eyes were the same. Differences. He was the very model, even to the brown complexion, of some British officer who had a long spell in India. He was shaved clean, his hair was parted in the middle, and he had cut his eyebrows. Not Mr. Scudder. Captain Theopolis Digby of the 40th Gurkhas. Presently home on leave. I'll thank you to remember that, sir. What? I made him up a bed in the smoking room and sought my own couch, more cheerful than I had been for the past month. Things did happen occasionally, even in this god-forgotten metropolis. Ah, there we go! Second chapter completed, and I hope to see you for the next one. Thanks for watching, guys.